In this tutorial, I'm going to be talking about equipment used to generate radiotherapy beams from radioactive sources, as opposed to via the acceleration of electrons. Radioactive sources in radiotherapy are generally used in either brachytherapy, which is putting a source close to or inside a target, or teletherapy, which is treating a target using a beam generated at some distance away from the patient. The general term used to describe treatments that are carried out using a beam that's generated outside of the patient is external beam radiotherapy. But when the beam is generated using a gamma ray source, we generally refer to it as teletherapy. It was most popular during the early to mid 20th century when man-made X-ray beams had a fairly limited energy. Gamma sources could produce photons of much higher energy than X-ray tubes, which was great if we wanted to treat structures that were beneath the skin. Having the beam source some distance away from the patient also helped to improve the ability of these beams to target deeper structures, but this was at the expense of the dose rate. Both of these effects are due to something called the inverse square law. This is an important one to know since it pops up quite a bit in radiotherapy dose calculations and it also explains why maintaining distance from radiation sources is such an important part of radiation protection. In a very small nutshell, more photons mean more dose, but as we move further and further away from a radiation source the photons spread out. This means you get fewer photons passing through a given area and therefore a lower dose. The photons spread out most quickly when you're very very close to the source and less quickly when you're further away. If we graph photon intensity versus distance from the source, it looks like this. When the distance from the source is low, so when you're very close, the gradient is very high. So the dose drops off very quickly with distance. When you're further away, the gradient is low, so the dose drops off much more slowly with distance. The relationship is, the dose decreases as the square of distance from the source increases. That's why the curve is this shape. You'll often see it written as, dose varies with 1 and r squared, with r being the radial distance from the source. This means that if you double your distance, your dose is decreased by a factor of 4. If you triple your distance, your dose is decreased by a factor of 9. If you quadruple your distance, your dose is decreased by a factor of 16, and so on. As a beam passes through your patient, the number of photons passing through a given point decreases due to attenuation and due to spreading out by the inverse square law. So if the source is close to the patient, the inverse square law is going to make the dose fall off very, very quickly. If the source is further away, the inverse square law is going to make it fall off much more slowly. So this is why having a beam source further away from a patient enables it to deliver more dose at greater depths. The design concept of teletherapy units is incredibly simple. It's basically a lump of radioactive material surrounded by a shielded container with a hole in it that can be opened to release a beam. In the first half of the 20th century, we were limited to naturally available radioactive materials. The one that was used most prominently in medicine was radium. Radium has always been impractically expensive to produce in bulk, because it involves extracting trace elements from large amounts of other materials, such as mining waste. It also has an extremely long half-life of 1600 years. The half-life is the amount of time it takes for a sample of material to emit half of the radiation that it's capable of producing. So it's an indicator of how quickly a sample of material produces radiation. An isotope with a long half-life like this one will produce radiation very slowly. That means that if you want to get a high rate of photon emission, you have to use a lot of it, and sources can become quite large. If we want to use a radiation source to treat a patient over here, all the photons produced over this side of the source have to pass through a whole lot of metal before they can reach the patient, and a lot of them will be absorbed. This means that large sources are very inefficient, which means the same thing for radioisotopes that have a long half-life. After World War II ended, a lot of effort went into finding non-destructive uses for all the nuclear technology that had been produced in the last 5-10 to 10 years. One of the most prominent examples of this is the use of nuclear reactors to create artificial radioisotopes to use in medicine. Cobalt-60 was chosen as an ideal candidate for use as a teletherapy source. Since it produces high-energy gamma rays, similar in energy to those produced by radium, it decays quickly, having a half-life of just over 5 years compared with radium-1600 years, which means it produces radiation at a very high rate, allowing for smaller sources and higher dose rates. 40 grams of Cobalt-60 could produce roughly the same radiation output of 1.5 kilograms of radium, which was a massive leap forward since a 1.5 kilogram source of radium was never going to be practical. As the amount of purified radium in the world at the time of the invention of the cobalt-60 teletherapy machine was about 2.5 kilograms. Cobalt units are set up a lot like linear accelerators. They have a treatment head and an opening for the beam. It contains a radioactive source, which when it's in the out position, is able to shine its beam out through the opening in the treatment head. But when we want to turn the beam off, the source is pulled back into a shield that's safe. Beneath the beam opening, there's a system of mobile shields or jaws which allow us to shape the beam but that may well be the most complicated part of the machine. The whole thing is basically a radiation shield with a hole in it. The source can be moved into a position where the beam can escape, and into a position where it can't, so it can be turned off and on. The fact that we're using a radioactive source instead of electronically generating photons has a few implications for the way the beam behaves. 
Radioactive sources have a finite amount of radiation they can produce, and they're used up over time. So the number of photons they put out per second tends to drop over time. This places limitations on the machine's dose rate. It also means that the radiation source needs to be changed every few years. It requires the handling and disposal of radioactive material, which can be quite dangerous. It also means that the source is always emitting radiation. You can't turn it off the way you can a linear accelerator or x-ray tube, which has its own implications for radiation safety. Say, for example, if the source fails to retract to the off position, it may pose a significant radiation safety risk to staff. The edges of a teletherapy beam tend to be more fuzzy than those produced by modern radiotherapy units, so we'd say that they have a wider beam per number. This is because when we generate x-rays via the bremsch jarling process, we can use a very thin beam of electrons, which we would call a pencil beam, which interact within the target only in a small area, so photons arise from a very small spot. This allows for very sharply defined beam edges. But radioactive sources are comparatively large, so they produce photons across a larger area. So this blows the beam out across a larger area when we shape it at some distance from the patient, as we tend to do in external beam radiotherapy. Also, while teletherapy units produce a high energy beam for their time, these beams are of significantly lower energy than those produced by modern machines. So they're not as efficient at delivering doses at significant depths within a patient. On the plus side though, linear accelerators, which are the radiotherapy machine of choice across much of the world, are extremely complicated while teletherapy units are not. This makes cobalt machines much easier to maintain, so there may be a better choice for using departments in parts of the world where maintenance could be problematic. They also have a very stable dose rate, which makes them very useful in the calibration of dose measuring equipment. We've mentioned a couple of times already that photon beams produced by the bremsch jarling interaction have an energy spectrum that increases linearly as the energy decreases, so they're mostly composed of low energy photons. This means that the average energy of a beam tends to be a lot lower than its maximum energy. The spectrum of beams generated by a gamma ray emission tends to look very, very different. Gamma sources emit photons at very specific energies. Take cobalt-60, for example, which emits photons at energies of 1.33 and 1.17 MeV. This pure emission spectrum, so if a beam was able to get out of a teletherapy machine without hitting anything, has quite a high average energy because it doesn't have that low energy bremsch jarling component. But the beam isn't actually able to leave the unit without hitting anything, so the spectrum tends to look a bit more like this. So some of these 1.33 MeV photons are going to hit stuff as they leave the unit, so they'll be scattered and lose some of their energy. So the height of this 1.33 MeV peak decreases, and a lower energy component is added to the spectrum. The same happens with the 1.17 MeV peak. It interacts, so the peak height is decreased, and there's more low energy component added. If we add the total spectrum together, it will look like this purple line here. The region between the 1.33 and 1.17 MeV emissions remains the same because none of the 1.17 MeV photons can gain energy and add to it. The region at and below the 1.17 MeV peak is increased, since the two low energy scattered components of each photon peak add together. This still results in an average beam energy that's much closer to the beam maximum energy than is seen in the bremsch jarling beam, because there are fewer low energy photons and more higher energy photons. So for a given peak energy, isotope beams tend to have a higher average energy than bremsch jarling beams. Cobalt-60 isn't the only artificial isotope that's been used in teletherapy units. Cesium-137 has also been used as well, but much less often. This is partly because cesium-137 has a much longer half-life than cobalt-60, and therefore produces a lower dose rate. This meant that these units had to be positioned much closer to the patient in order to be practical, so they weren't really used at source-to-surface distances above 50 centimeters, whereas cobalt-60 units were routinely used at distances of 80 to 100 centimeters. But a much bigger problem with cesium units is the actual composition of the source. Cobalt-60 sources tend to be made up of little lumps of radioactive metal. This can be hazardous if you happen to sit next to them, but cesium-137 sources are made out of a water-soluble salt such as cesium chloride. The problem with having a radioactive salt is that a powder can be spread across a large area, and the fact that it's soluble means that it can soak into things like the ground and the human body. So it's a huge radiation safety issue It can contaminate huge areas of land. The radiation sources used inside these units can be managed quite safely if done properly, but there have been some very, very prominent examples of when it's gone badly. For example, in Thailand, when a defunct Cobalt-60 unit was left in a fenced-off car park, the shielded head containing the radioactive source was stolen and sold for scrap metal. It was then taken apart with a blowtorch, which freed the source and irradiated a large number of people. In Mexico and Taiwan, radioactive Cobalt sources actually made their way into the metal recycling chain which led to a large number of homes being built with radioactive steel. Some apartments in Taipei were inhabited by unwitting occupants for as long as 20 years. In Brazil, a cesium-137 unit was left unattended in a partially demolished hospital. It was again stolen for scrap and dismantled. The source assembly itself was also ruptured, freeing some of the powder, 
Having radioactive powder floating around is extremely dangerous, but this was made even worse when it was discovered that the powder glowed blue in the dark. Friends and family were invited over to see it, and even given samples to take home. This resulted in massive doses of radiation to those directly affected, as well as smaller doses to a large number of people in the surrounding area. In Spain, a cesium source made it unnoticed into a furnace in a metal recycling plant, which led to the release of a radioactive cloud that was detected across several countries. Hazards like these can be avoided by properly keeping track of sources, or by using machines that don't contain radioactive material. Incidents like these prompted the development of a new radiation warning sign to be placed inside of these units, which better encompasses the danger associated with taking them apart.